OK. So we're going to talk about why we should call variance in, at the cohort level and how we do that. So um, it's almost never useful to just take a single genome and look at it because we need context. And this is sort of, in, in there are a few cases, like rare variant association studies where, where one genome is meaningful, but usually you're looking at large cohorts. And it's, we can get a lot of information out of a large cohort, which can help us actually call variants better. So if you make individual calls, so the one workflow is to make, take each individual BAM and make, make variant calls from it, and then do sort of a joint analysis on it. But you'll lose information that you could have potentially gained, and you'll lose power to detect certain variants if you don't look at the calls, the, if you don't do the calling simultaneously. And so there's this process of joint variant discovery, which lets us do better than calling individually and then combining them after the fact. So, and, and for instance, we can, we can detect variants that are sort of represented poorly in some samples, but are strongly seen in the entire cohort. We can, we can have a sort of set of prior to call them more, with to call them less information or to screen out artifacts. So, so in, here we have an example of we, we see a variant with sort of low, low evidence for it in one sample, but if we see that in many other samples, we might know that this is a true site of variation in our cohort, and we could make more confident calls that the low information samples actually have this variant, or, or maybe that they don't. If we don't see it in other cohorts, we could tell that it's, it's uh, an artifact. So it lets us, it, it also looking at many samples simultaneously lets us sort of resolve issues of sequencing bias and alignment bias, because we can look, and we have many points of data, so instead of just saying, well, in this one we see a lot of bias, but we don't know if that's just sampling or if that's some aberration. If we look across the entire cohort, we can say, oh, we always see this allele as being, uh, this, this is being out of balance, so there's probably some sort of systematic effect that's, and we can adjust for that. That's some systematic bias, and we can make better calls if we adjust by that. We can filter ones that don't match, and we can keep ones that do. Um, so another, another thing we like to know about is if we, we like to know if something is homref or if it's just we couldn't make a call because we didn't have enough data. And so as part of the, the joint calling pipeline, we're going to be able to make confidences, we're going to be able to record confidences that we actually did, saw, that we saw a reference site rather than we didn't have enough information to make a call. And we're going to capture that data and keep it through the end. So if we see one site that's variant in, in some of our samples, we will know if it wasn't variant in the other samples or if it was just, uh, or if we just didn't have enough information to tell. So we're going to capture that information when we do the joint calling and, and record it. So typically, uh, with the Unified Genotyper, we, we could do joint calling, and we did it successfully in large-scale samples up to, say, 20,000. But we were really hitting sort of the, the technical, technical limits because to do it, in the Unified Genotyper style, you have to keep all the, you have to load all these 20,000 BAM simultaneously into memory and do comparisons across them, and it, it gets very crazy very quickly with the amount of compute you need. And with the haplotype caller, which is a much better caller, it's, but it's a more complicated and more expensive algorithm, we just couldn't do that with large sample sets. So there needed to be a, a new approach. Um, and actually, worse than just the problem of needing a very large computer to do this, is the problem of if you have, a you have a cohort and you call it all and then say you get a few more samples, you don't want to have to do this incredibly expensive calculation again with, the new, with one more sample. But in the old approach of doing simultaneous variant calling, you, ha you would have to do that. You had one more sample, you have to do the entire calculation over. Um, so the, we looked into some ways to re reduce the cost of this. We did some very cool, very fancy hardware optimization on Intel vectorized machines and on the GPU and, you know, you can get several several fold improvement but this e even so we that'll that enabled us to do say 20,000 samples on one computer but that doesn't scale to 100,000 or a million samples there's just no way our computer is going to we we can't you know steal the national laboratory's supercomputers to do this and then do it again when we get one more sample so and th this m1 problem is is the big the big thing so this guy is this is our new new guy in the cohort, and he's very sad because his calls are not going to be made. So how do we solve the N1 problem? So 
the the solution is to have some sort of intermediate to to have an intermediate representation that captures all the information we we would get from one BAM, and then we can do the calling further. We can compile this information separately, and then use a cheaper calling step to to cross to to do the joint calling. So we do the first sample. We run it through haplotype color, and we store the likelihoods rather than just true than just hard variant calls. We store the likelihood that this site was was home ref was home. Uh, Alt ref, or, or sorry, sorry, home alt, or was it heterozygous? And for each for each site, we're going to store these, and we can do some optimizations to not store all of that data for every single thing. We can, if lots of contiguous home ref sites, we can store as blocks with some some compression. And then, so once we do this, we can do it for many samples, and each time we do it, we store these likelihoods, and then we do another. We wait, we take these likelihoods, and we have a, a database or some some representation of these. And then we do the calling, and we, the calling step is much cheaper. It's the this joint genotyping, and it's it's a, a much cheaper calculation that we can do many times if we want. We can add in some samples, we can take out samples, and so then when we get more samples. We can just keep adding them in and doing the calling again. And the expensive uh, initial calling, the expensive initial haplotype caller stage is never repeated. So this this is a um, two, the two X was the old style variant discovery, and the 3x is the new style. So with the unified genotyper, we do this, this massive joint calling operation, and then all the downstream analysis. Here we've added in the new style, we've added a new step. We do individual genotype likelihood calculation, which is expensive per sample, but never has to be repeated. And then we do, each time we want to make variant calls, we do a joint genotyping across the entire cohort. And we can repeat that because it's much cheaper than it never has to touch the BAMs. It just has these looks at these summary statistics. And what we get out of it is these, at the final step, we get out these this genotype matrix. And that includes information about, about uh, home ref calls, which would be lost in sort of in the standard variant caller, which is just you call yes or no for each variant. And if you don't see it, you don't get any information. So we're actually including the likelihoods for every, for every allele for every sample, which is way more information and allows us to do things like call pertin pertinent negatives in a clinical setting. And so the advantages of this are that it's, it's incremental. We can do the processing in real time pretty much as they come off the sequencer. We can just take each sample, run haplotype color on it, and store these likelihoods. Um, and it lets us, and because of this, we can, it's powerful. We can use massive cohorts that we couldn't do, just couldn't fit it all into memory on a single machine. So we can do you know, the 91,000 samples we have in EXAC, or we can do uh, any larger sized cohort that's coming up. And it's easy and cheap to do it with different cohorts. And as we said, it's efficient because we only need to call variant, we, we only need to do this likelihood calculation once for every sample ever. And we can recall, we can do the cohort calling as new samples come in, we can do that over and over again, and it's inexpensive. And it'll let us just do way more exciting analyses that we couldn't realistically do on a single machine. So further reading, we have lots of information about this, and there is a manuscript in preparation right now, soon coming out soon. Very exciting. Okay, does anyone have any questions about sort of the general approach to joint variant calling? Okay, silence. Oh, one in the back. So if we have no coverage, we'll have a low, a, a, we don't have a, a high probability of anything, right? I, we, we, we will hit, we'll have an unconfident call of home ref. I, sorry, I'll let Geraldine fill in. Yeah, uh, so basically, it, you're saying if there's no coverage, uh, you just have a no call for that sample. And so that is captured, like it, it essentially says, I have no coverage at the site, and therefore I cannot make any kind of decision. So when you're doing the joint genotyping, basically you're going to ignore any no calls because they're not informative one way or the other. Um, and it's actually really powerful to be able to distinguish that, that it's, it's a no call we don't know, as opposed to, oh, there's no evidence for variation, so it's home ref. And that's where it really comes in handy. It, 
So this, um, uh, Sheila is going to go over like the actual implementation of how it looks and the, the how we capture that information. But it's basically a special type of GVCF. Uh, and she's going to go over the de details of that. And yes, that's exactly sort of the, that, that is exactly what we're trying to enable, that you can do calling and then later when you get more information, it's easy to come back and call again with more information for better genotypes. Uh, yeah, and if you decide that you want to add sequence from the grandparents, from the cousins, whatever, you can add them as you go uh, because that, that hard part is done per sample. So you just add any ones that you want and then you, the, the only step that you have to rerun is, is from the genotype GVCFs, which is very fast in comparison. Can we answer your question yeah. one first? So, so question one was, was how, how, what happens with batch effects when you do sequential joint calling? And the answer is in the joint calling, you've captured sort of all the information about the, the evidence at each site in the genotype, in the, the, the initial uh, likelihoods calling. But then you can deal with the batch effects in the joint calling. And actually having the entire sample set will allow you to, to deal with the batch effects probably better than if you tried to do it all at once because you have all of the possible data, including any metadata that you want to add in. Yeah, you're basically you're basically removing the the possibility of batch effects that you would otherwise get because people otherwise did like, oh, I'll do my first hundred samples, call them together, then I'll call my my second hundred samples when they become available, they roll off the sequencer, and then I'll take the two call sets and merge that together. Major batch batch effect. Whereas with with this, since it's a feature, it's part of the, the basic design that you run each sample individually, and then you, you just do that, that join part, you redo it with all together, all the samples together, uh, you, you completely eliminate that source of batch effects. Now, it does require that you use the same versions of the programs. Um, like, if you, if you get some new sequence five years later and we've massively uh, improved the algorithm, unfortunately, you would have to redo that calling uh, if you want to use the new version. So that, that is the one big caveat is that, but th that's always the case when you start uh, an analysis um, project. You are, once you start, you are stuck with that version of the program aside from like small bug fixes, but otherwise you cannot prevent batch effects from creeping in. So that's, that's always a, a caveat of any study you do. You can run it on any N, but it, the larger the sample size you have, the better results you're going to get. What is the, for VQSR though, there's minimum sample sizes. So there's kind of three levels. The minimum technical N is one. You need one sample at least to run. But you can run on just the one. Um, you can, the next kind of level, uh, joking aside, is for the next step of uh, filtering, we recommend to have at least 30 samples. If you're doing exome, you have to have at least 30 samples because you have to have enough variance in your call set. Um, and if you don't have that in your cohort, you would get a cohort from the thousand genomes or from the exact data now, uh, so you would find some exomes that are preferably similar technically to yours, and so you can run on those. Um, and finally, the, the next level, <clears throat> right now, um, in terms of how high can you go, well, we've done the, the exact, which is 92,000 uh, exomes. Right now, we're not at those numbers for whole genome, because that's just a whole lot more data. Um, and we're, we're kind of in the hundreds of thousands are technically possible for exomes. But there's not really more available that you can get anyway. But they are coming. There are a lot more coming. So the, a lot of the development going on right now is to get to the next order of magnitude on both exomes and whole genomes.
So the question is, can you use joint calling on genomes right now? And the answer is, is yes, you can. And what, at what scale? Uh, um, I'm honestly not sure in terms of the scale. Oh. Uh, yeah. So to capture that for posterity, it's currently in the 5 to 800 genomes, just because the, the mic can't hear you. Yeah, so it's feasible. We, we are, it is demonstrated to be feasible for five to 800 uh, whole genomes. Um, and the, the scale projections are, are to get to at least what we can do with exomes, so the 100,000 um, yeah. a year. Can I promise a year? Probably promise This is not a promise. If you have 100,000 whole genomes, we'd like to see them. Okay, not a promise. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yes, there's that too. Lend them to us and we'll tell you how many. <laughs> Actually, there's a gentleman in the back from my. Really? <laughs> anyway, um, yes, I will let you carry on. Any more questions? Does anyone have more questions? Or? Oh, yes, there. So this, our current set of tools doesn't, is optimized for germline samples and actually it would probably eliminate your, your somatic mutations if you ran just this, this set, but there's this general methodology of calling likelihoods and then doing some post-processing on that is definitely applicable. Uh, so the, the haplotype caller, for instance, uh, we actually have, can we talk about M2? Yeah. yeah. So we have a, a new version of Mutect coming out soon, which is based on the same haplotype caller technology which will then sort of allow similar downstream analysis like this joint calling, but soon. Uh, soon. <laughs> yes. That, that's on the order of a uh, couple months? Tops. Yeah, months probably. Yeah. yeah. So soon, actually soon. It's, it's built, it works, we're just, they're, they're in the process of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, of validating the results and making sure that everything looks good, but basically the program is built, so uh, pretty soon. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. It gets way better in Dells. <laughs> Does anyone else have questions?